Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Today we're going to be talking about bankruptcy, a little bit about Chapter 7, as well as Chapter 13, and some non-bankruptcy alternatives. Joining me is my co-host, Jesse Barrientes. Jesse, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much, Dave. How are you doing this evening? Oh, debt-free, Jesse. How are you? Oh, debt-free. Yeah, Fantastic. that's the topic. It and is. I'm kind of kidding, because right. we're all carrying debt. But let's talk about this terrible, terrible situation we have in this country right now. What's that, Dave? Lack of jobs, no interest rates, housing foreclosure crisis, skyrocketing gas prices, food prices, political fighting, infighting. What do we do? Well, I don't know about the political infighting because it, if, if people could get rid of that with a bankruptcy, they would have done that a long time ago, right? Clean them all out, they right? Clean them all out there. But uh, when you talk about bankruptcy, and we'll talk about the different chapters, chapter 7 or chapter 13, this is a way to be able to get yourself out, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, and to get out from under this incredible pressure. Because if you're like most people, most people live paycheck to paycheck, right? Yeah, 61% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And if something happens, you need to take care of your car because it broke down, or your furnace, or perhaps even uh, uh, an accident and you have medical bills, or maybe, we, we talked the last show about divorce, maybe it's a divorce and there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of debt that you have for a whole bunch of different kinds of things. And so a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll rob Peter to pay Paul, right? Well, they they'll, might be tempted to get a payday loan. They, they might, which is something I think we should talk about. That and title loans as well, because there's a distinct difference between the two. And so they rob Peter to pay Paul, they use one credit card, and then they pay the other balance off with the other one. They go back and forth and back and forth and only pay the minimum balance. I come in, Dave, and I tell you, Dave, I have great credit. Your score is great. My score is great. But I you're have great credit. How much debt? Oh, it's it's not that bad. It's only seventy five thousand dollars. Yeah. Then I don't care what your score is. Yeah, but I have a great credit score. I don't want to screw it up. Well, keep carrying around seventy thousand dollars worth of debt and keep your score up. Well, how long if is that's that important gonna, to you? How long is that going to take me if I pay? Uh, if I just pay the uh, minimum balance? 20 to 30 years. Really? Yes. You think I have that long left? Possibly. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's Possibly. a thought. Well, what's a better route to take? Well, you got to look at your options. There's a couple ways to get out. There's Chapter 7 Fresh Start. Oh, what does a Chapter 7 Fresh Start do for you? That's when you don't have a lot in the way of assets, but you have a ton of debt, whether it be unsecured debt like medical bills, credit card bills, personal loans, utility bills, auto deficiencies, foreclosure deficiencies. If you're making under a certain dollar amount and you don't have significant assets, you can get a complete fresh start. Now, there are some debts that don't go away. Okay, like what? Student loans, recent taxes, parking tickets, child support, alimony. Recent taxes? Yes, so any I, tax within the last three years. So anything beyond that? Let's say I owe the government uh, 20 grand from five years ago. Well, I file taxes in every one of those years. If you file the return on time during those years, and you didn't commit any type of fraud, then those tax debts will typically be eliminated in a Chapter 7. I can get rid of those? You could. Is it like a possibly kind of thing? I thought death and taxes were certain and sure. Well, recent taxes are certain. Okay. And death is certain. Oh, true enough. Well, what about things like, I've had people come in and uh, talk about uh, the good old tollway fees, uh, because I, I don't understand, well, I do understand how you can accumulate fees, but when people come in and they tell me they owe fifty thousand uh, dollars because they've blown, you know, yeah. they they haven't put their transponder up. Well, they usually that, say someone borrowed my car. Right. They ran through the lights, so there's red light camera violations, there's tollway violations, and there's parking tickets. And now that they got the car back, they want to work something out because their license is about ready to get suspended. So can I not get rid of the tollway, the fifty thousand dollars through bankruptcy? You cannot. Those are non-dischargeable debts. They do not go away. But you could agree to repay them over the next three to five years 
and keep your license in good standing as long as you're making timely payments. Or you could even negotiate with them to reduce it because a lot of times it's jacked up because of interest and penalties and all of those type of things. Yeah, or you can just pitch the car and take public transportation. Well, that's certainly uh, an option. There's a lot of options here. Well, let's look at some other kinds of debts because, you know, people are, we talked about, and we've done shows about that, uh, about foreclosure and, and predatory lending. That's all over the news. Don't need to talk about that. But what about uh, these other folks that are kind of preying on, uh, on people? You mentioned before um, title loans and payday, paycheck loans, those kinds of things. Well, you say preying on people. They're just a storefront or an internet site that provides a service for a fee. Oh, oh, there we go. What kind of a fee, Dave? Well, it really depends. Usury interest rates, right? They're high interest rates, and usually when someone goes in for a payday loan, statistically, they roll that over four to six different times. So it's not just one loan. It's a consecutive loans where the interest compiles and compounds on each other. So it's not simple interest? It's not simple interest, and it becomes more than just, uh, I need money till payday, and then I'm going to be okay. It's usually a, a loan that, that kind of carries over almost like a unsecured loan. Well, explain to the folks at home what the difference between a secured and unsecured loan or debt is. Well, a secured loan or a secured debt is something that's secured by property, whereby if you don't make the payment, the lender has the ability to repossess something, whether it be a vehicle, a piece of collateral that they can sell. An unsecured loan is just your signature. If you don't pay, they don't have any recourse to take anything back other than try and sue you and collect upon it, which is very difficult to do. So a uh, payday loan is what type of a loan? Well, it's or technically, kind of it's a pseudo-secured, unsecured loan because someone could simply cancel their bank account or lose their job so you're saying and then they can't get paid. It's secured by your bank account. But yes. if I change that, I mean, so it's not really a secured debt. It's something that would be discharged if I did a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Right. There could be some circumstances where somebody commits fraud by obtaining payday loans too close to filing or in certain dollar amounts or limits, and that could be held to be non-dischargeable, but I don't see that too much. Uh, payday loans don't have a lot of favor in the, in the bankruptcy court. Well, uh, how, about a, uh, uh, how about a title loan? Well, a title loan, you're giving up the title to your car. So that's a secured debt. It is a secured debt. If you want to have clean title to be able to trade or sell your car, you've got to pay off that debt. So if I want to, if I want to keep the car, got to pay it. If I want to discharge it, they get the car and we're done. Right. But the title company can also repossess the vehicle if you don't make your payments and sell it at auction. So it's more than just the title. They can actually repossess the vehicle. Well, I, I often hear a lot of people talk about wanting that fresh start, but they say, you know, what if I have a house, Dave? Am I going to be able to still do a Chapter 7 fresh start? I own this house. It's an asset, really. And uh, what do I do with that? Well, it depends on the value of the house, and it depends on what's owed on the house. You can file a Chapter 7 fresh start, and as an individual, protect up to $15,000 worth of equity in your real estate. So if I'm married, that would be $30,000. I could have $30,000 worth of equity in the house. That is correct. Well, I guess, you know, what happens then uh, if it's maybe a little more than that? Well, if it's a little more than that, it's not a problem. If it's a lot more than that, then it is a problem because a trustee can sell it, pay you your equity, or your exemption rather, and then use the remaining proceeds to go towards your creditors. So I, if I had $50,000 in it between my wife and I uh, and uh, the trustee sold it, I would get my 30000 bucks. Yes, you would get fifteen, and your, your spouse would get fifteen. Now, typically, though, there's a misconception out there that people feel they have to be absolutely penniless and broke to file for bankruptcy. You'd be surprised to know that many people own a home, they own a vehicle, they have a bank account, they have household goods and furnishing, they have plenty of clothing, and those items are typically protected including retirement accounts, death benefit life insurance. Annuities? Annuities depends on what type and how much, but it, it, you can typically keep all of your property in a Chapter 7 as long as you don't have excessive property. And if you do have excessive property or a lot of value in your property, free and clear, then Chapter 13 is the better way to go because you keep all of that and repay a portion of your debt over time. I want to explore the Chapter 13 in just a second, but when we're talking about a Chapter 7 here, uh, what happens if I'm behind on my mortgage in a Chapter 7? Well, uh, you're subject to foreclosure if you fall behind. 
well, they haven't filed anything. I'm maybe $10,000 behind. Uh, can I still do a Chapter 7 and keep my house? You can still do a Chapter 7 and keep your house. You just have to find a way to catch up, either through loss mitigation or a loan modification or some other form of repayment plan with your mortgage company so that you can maintain the status quo with your house. Do I need to do that before I file the bankruptcy? You don't need to. You can be behind on your house and file for Chapter 7. You can be up to date and file for Chapter 7. What's important is what stage is it in terms of foreclosure. No, I haven't received any complaint uh, yet here, and uh, I'm just I'm filing this. I mean, are they going to uh, work with me, especially after or now I file this uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcy? They are going to work with you if you have the ability to repay. And if I don't have the ability to repay? Sorry, Charlie, they're going to foreclose even though I filed the bankruptcy. Right. They can't look to you for any money in terms of a deficiency or any kind of collection activity. However, they can pursue the foreclosure to the extent that they can get the property out of your name into their name, and they can then put it on the market and sell it. Well, what, uh, what typically is the, you know, the, the turnaround time? In a foreclosure case or a bankruptcy in case? In a bankruptcy, in a Chapter 7. Well, from filing until discharge is approximately 120 days. You go to a one court date, a meeting of creditors where you are interviewed by the trustee approximately four to six weeks after filing, and then you wait another additional two to three months for a discharge letter, which is the final document that's sent to all of your creditors, to you and to your attorney, notifying everyone that the case has gone through to completion and none of the dischargeable debts can come back to get you. Well, let me ask you this. A lot of people uh, are tired of the bill collectors, and a lot of them aren't really... Uh, consistent with the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And so, uh, you know, they, they, they call at all different times. They call at work. Uh, I'm going to lose my job. Well, you know, what, what, what's going to happen when I file that Chapter 7? Well, if you're having creditors call you all day and night at home, at work, that's a number one sign that you have a debt problem and that you need to look into it and make some kind of uh, modification. Uh, chapter 7 will eliminate the creditor calls immediately. In fact, once you hire an attorney and you give that creditor your attorney's name and number, that creditor is prohibited from contacting you directly under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And of course, once they receive the bankruptcy notice, that's like gold. Once they get that case number and the automatic stay is sent there, creditors are prohibited from contacting you, or they can be sanctioned by the bankruptcy court for violating the automatic stay. So if I hire you, even before I file something, and I tell them I'm being represented by Mr. Siegel, then they cannot no longer contact me. That is correct. They can't contact you. They could still bring litigation against you, but it wouldn't be smart because it'd be a waste of their money and their time. Because once they call my office and get verification that you've actually hired me and that we're representing you and we're going to be doing a Chapter 7 or a 13, most creditors and collection agencies and law firms will put it on hold for a little bit and wait to see if a case is actually going to be filed in the next month or two. So, uh, really, uh, my best bet to be able to take care of all these headaches if I do have that situation is to go ahead and, and talk to a bankruptcy attorney. Yes, and there's, there's a lot of clients out there that will take advantage of that situation where they'll make a down payment, make a payment or two, and then never pay again, knowing that they've got some protection from the law firm. But what will happen with my firm is you'll be taken off the system once you breach on your payment plan, and the creditors will then be free to contact you once again. So, but again, you mentioned earlier, once, uh, once it gets filed, now we're, we're golden in terms of not, uh, people not contacting me and, and getting all of this debt discharged. Now, what happens if after we file the bankruptcy, uh, I get this solicitation for a credit card and I go out and charge something? Well, if it's after the case is filed, then it's non-dischargeable. It's going to be what they call a post-petition or after-filing debt, and you're able to reestablish your credit, and then you're on the hook for that. Well, so can't, can't you just simply uh, refile or amend it or anything like that? Well, you can't amend it, and you can refile, but you have to wait eight years on a Chapter 7. To, oh, to refile. Right. But, and that's why you got the offer it, for the credit card, because the credit card company knew you were not eligible to file a Chapter 7 for another eight years. No, if it gets dismissed, what I'm talking about is during the pendency of my bankruptcy. If you dismiss the case prior to a discharge, then you could refile. It, it, suppose we're in the we we haven't finished our bankruptcy. I don't have my discharge, and uh, again, I, I make those charges. You said that you can amend it or you cannot. You cannot amend it, but you do have the ability to dismiss the case and refile. But it's very rare that you're going to see something like that. What you might see is someone will file one day, and then the very next day they might have a catastrophic illness or a hospitalization, 
In those situations, that person might not want to go through with the bankruptcy. Let the case dismiss and refile once all of their medical treatment is over. And that's acceptable? It's not fraudulent. Okay. Well, I don't know about it's, acceptable. It's, it's interesting. Okay, it's very not good. Fraud. It's very it's, different. It's good bankruptcy planning. Well, what happens uh, going back to the house situation uh, where I have uh, too much equity and I, I really want to keep my house? So you mentioned a Chapter 13. What's the difference? What's a Chapter 13? Well, Chapter 13 is where you're going to repay your creditors over a three to five year Well, what period. do I need you for if I'm going to repay them? I don't want to repay them. Well, it's one place to pay. See, if you try and work out all deals with your individual creditors, you're going to get some that want to help you, some that don't. Some are going to take 50%. Some are going to just say, no, we're going to sue you because we know you have equity. We know you have a job. We've seen your tax return because you had applied for the loan. So Chapter 13, it makes it mandatory that the creditors must either participate in the repayment plan or the debt is eliminated. So you have one place to pay. It's going through a Chapter 13 trustee. It's usually coming out of your wages through your job if you're working. So it really is a great way to hold off the creditors and, very importantly, pay less than 100% back in most cases. What about interest or penalties interest and fees? Interest is stopped on the creditors. However, you do pay an administrative fee of anywhere from 4 to 6% to the Chapter 13 trustee because that trustee is collecting all the funds and administering all the payments but that's, over a three to five year period. That's less than the interest I'd be paying on all the other debt, typically. Much less. And plus, again, if you're paying less than 100% back, that little bit of interest on the amount that you're paying right. is de minimis, sometimes as low as two to 5,000 over a five year period. Well, it's interesting to note, too, that if you make your own deal with the credit card company, and for example, let's say they accept half or they accept three quarters and I pay them a lump sum, guess what you're going to get at the end of that tax year? 1099. Oh, what do you mean, Dave? Yeah, the part that they wrote off is going to be now includable in your taxable income. So you haven't really gotten the deal that you got. Right. Because you have to factor in what the tax is on the part that they wrote off. So I'm going to have That's to That's not the case in Chapter 13. Right. But I'm going to have So in that situation, I'm going to have to pay taxes on it. But in Chapter 13, I am not. That is correct. Chapter 13, Jesse, is most commonly used to save a home that's in foreclosure. It allows you to pay the mortgage arrearages over the next three to five years, and be able to make your regular mortgage payment once again. And we're in this foreclosure crisis. It's amazing to me that more people are not opting for Chapter 13 to save their home and repay their debt over time. So uh, essentially then, in order to find out if somebody's uh, qualified, it, basically you have to have something, well, not just something. You, not only do you have to have something available after your allowable expenses, right? But that something has to be enough to pay your secured creditors 100% and your unsecured creditors from 10% to 100% over the course of 36 or 60 months. Right. It really depends on your income, your expenses, and your debt. I also wanted to point out, Jesse, that the government mandates that you take a credit counseling session before you can afford yourself with this relief. And then once you afford yourself with the relief, you have to take a two-hour financial management class, also brought about by the government. Well, what do I have to take the first class for? I, I'm not in this situation because I didn't take a class. Well, the government and Congress hoped that you would not file a bankruptcy once you learned about the credit counseling that was available and the non-bankruptcy alternatives, which include working out a debt management plan with your creditors, working out an installment payment plan, borrowing money from someone to make a lump sum payment. Dave, can I borrow some money from you to make a lump sum payment to all of my creditors? I'm fresh out. Okay. Very I'm fresh good. out. But you might want to try the bank down the corner. Okay. Okay. And if you got some form of collateral, you might get a loan, but it still not, may not be a good thing to do. For well, example, taking a second mortgage out or a lien against your property to pay credit card debt. That's debt that can be discharged. But and once I take it out, I'm out of luck. Right, because now you've turned unsecured debt into secured debt by linking it to your house. Now you're going to be paying for your house forever. Oh, wow. That, and a day. And forever and a day. Yep, that's uh, always have to add that in there. Well, Dave, uh, what about other types of things? You mentioned that there was another class I have to take afterwards. Yes, after your case is filed, but before you receive a discharge. Okay, so now we've gone through the class where uh, I'm trying to explore bankruptcy alternatives, and we're past that. I filed it. So why do I need to take another class? Because in the infinite wisdom of the Congress and the government, you need to be educated now, Jesse, in everything from life insurance to mortgages to purchasing a car to budgeting. Anything related to personal finance, over a two-hour period, you're going to know everything you need to know. And so 
as a result of sitting through these classes, I won't have any more problems. You won't have any more problems unless you continue down the same road that caused you to file. So for example, if you were someone who didn't have health insurance, right. but you have health issues, you're going to be back in debt because the bills are going to pile up. If you're someone who overcharged with credit cards and like to spend and like to buy and purchase, you're likely going to get credit cards again and spend again. So you have to change your conduct. And that's, that's with anything in life. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to get the same result. Let me ask you, when, when you uh, file your petition for either a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, I have to lay all of my information out, all of my assets, uh, anybody who owes me money or any, anything else I owe to anybody as well. Yeah. It all has to be laid out. Full disclosure, Jesse. Well, what happens, Dave, if I, I have this, I've got this lawsuit, somebody hit me uh, in their car, and, you know, well, you know, that might be years down the line. That's kind of why I'm uh, in a little trouble here is because all these medical bills from this car accident. You got rear-ended? And I got rear-ended. And so what happens then about that, that claim? It might be, you know, I broke yeah. a leg. It might it's be a car worth, accident, right? Yeah, it might be okay. worth uh, half a million dollars. I, sure. mean, I don't know. All right, well, here's the deal. If you have a significant injury and you're going to receive more than $7,500 in your pocket as proceeds, but how do I know that? Because my lawyer keeps on telling me, hey, listen, you know what, we're, we're, we're going for another deposition or, or um, you know, there's another status case or we have to wait or it's sent to arbitration or mediate. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm going to get 7500 bucks. Well, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, if they don't settle, I, you know, I may get nothing. If you I, I don't file know. a Chapter 7 after the accident, the Chapter 7 trustee can keep the case open and monitor it. That Chapter 7 trustee can also replace your injury attorney with an attorney of his or her choosing. But typically they will allow your attorney to continue to handle the case. Well, why do I care about the case anymore if the bankruptcy trustee is going to take all my money? Well, the bankruptcy trustee is not going to take all your money. You're going to get a $7,500 exemption, Jesse, which is not chump change. So I'm going to get 7500 bucks for my broken leg. Well, it happens. You know? You're also getting out of debt. So in exchange for your fresh start, you're giving up anything in in excess of 7500 for the injury case. There's also another interesting caveat to that. In the event that you do not make a disclosure of your injury claim and you file an injury claim after your Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy case, it can be dismissed. That is to say yeah. your injury case. Yeah, and, and also the, uh, the Chapter 7 trustee could probably administer the whole case, not give you your exemption, and maybe even dismiss your case, barring you from a discharge in the future. So there are a lot of consequences, not to mention the criminal consequences for, uh, for not being candid with the court. Yeah, well, you always want to be open and honest with your attorney. You're going to sit down with your attorney. You're going to fill out a questionnaire. You're going to have to list all of your assets, all of your liabilities. You're then going to be interviewed by the attorney. So you're going to get prompted with questions on whether or not you have a lawsuit pending for personal injury or workers' compensation. Do you expect to inherit any money in the next six months? That's another big one. If I don't you know. How, how are you feeling, Dave? I'm feeling pretty good. Okay, but, well, but, then I don't expect to inherit any money uh, yeah. <laughs> in the near future. If I wasn't feeling good, I don't know what you'd be getting. Uh, maybe one of my watches. I don't know. Oh, it'd be, oh yeah, I already have one I of gave them. it away already. Exactly. Um, um, but no, if you inherit money six, within six months after filing, that inheritance becomes property of your bankruptcy estate and goes to your creditors. Within six months? Yes. What if I just tell them to hang on to that money for a little while longer? No, for the no, that would be dishonest. That it's would be done. fraud. It's got to go to your creditors. Okay. And you should want to repay your creditors, Jesse. Well, I, you shouldn't I, want to game the system and get a fresh start. I do, Dave. And in fact, you know, uh, I pay my creditors uh, all of the time. It's just, uh, you know, some of my debtors don't pay this creditor. Right. Well, there might come a day when you or I or other people find themselves in a situation where they can't. And that's what this federal law is all about, either a fresh start or a reorganization under Chapter 13. It's helped thousands of people in the local area every year. Let me ask you this, because this is a common question that I get as well. Okay, uh, well, aren't I going to lose my car? I, you know, I, I really need my car to be able to, to work. If I don't have my car, I can't work, and I'm going to be in worse shape. Well, it depends on what the value of your car is. If it's a paid-off car worth ten or $15,000, then Chapter 7 is not going to be for you. Well, Dave, I, I'm, I'm making payments on my car. I owe... Oh. I owe money on my car, but I, 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 I still need it. Okay, as long as there's not significant equity, 
over $2,400 worth of equity in your car, you'll be able to reaffirm it, which means you're going to obligate yourself to make those payments once again, and you'll be able to keep the car straight through beyond a bankruptcy. Well, can I get like a better deal on the price that I owe or on the interest or something like that? Typically, the auto finance companies in a Chapter 7 are not going to adjust the price. They're going to want you to sign back on the dotted line for the same monthly payment at the same interest rate. Well, I'm a little upside down, too, because what I owe on the car, Dave, is not exactly what it's worth. Well, you might be able to negotiate that with the lender, but I can never guarantee it. Now, in a Chapter 13, there's different ways to restructure. But in a Chapter 7, uh, you really have to reaffirm for the full amount. Unless you can get a redemption loan, Jesse, where someone else gives you the market value in one lump sum that you pay to the creditor, and then you have a loan for that amount. So that's called a 722, Section 722 redemption. But in most cases, plan on paying your regular car payment if you want to keep your car after a bankruptcy. What about a Chapter 13? You said there was a slight difference. Yeah, in no, Chapter 13, you can kind of break down in many cases the secured portion, in other words, what it's worth, and then the unsecured portion, the amount that you're upside down, we can sometimes pay less than 100% back. So if, if, uh, if the car is worth oh, I don't know, $10,000 less, right, than I owe, or, or more than I owe. So basically I owe... I owe uh, you owe 20, the car's worth 10? Right, exactly. 10,000 would be paid back in full. The other 10,000 could be paid back less than in full if that car was purchased more than two and a half years ago. So you can't run into a dealership, drive it for a year, and then try and cram it down. You have to uh, satisfy the statutory requirement of, of purchasing it more than two and a half years ago. Well, what happens then? Uh, you know, the car that I have, it really doesn't work so well. Um, I really want to get rid of it, but I'm, I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to buy a car after my bankruptcy. Well, don't worry about that. You certainly would be able to buy a car after bankruptcy as long as you have some sort of income. There are plenty of dealerships and auto finance companies that want to put you back into a car, Jesse, for a couple reasons. They're going to charge you a high mm -hmm. interest rate. And two, they know that you can't file again for eight years. And if you don't make the payments, they're just going to repossess the car and sell it at auction and come after you for the deficiency. Well, let me ask you one more question here that uh, you know people often ask, and that is, what's the difference on my credit between a Chapter 7 and a Chapter 13? Because in a Chapter 13, I'm actually repaying, in some cases, the whole amount, and in some cases not, but it's certainly uh, not like a Chapter 7. Is there any difference on my credit between the two? Well, realistically, you would think there'd be a difference because one, you're getting a fresh start and not paying people, and the other, you're paying people. But in reality, it's a bankruptcy. It's just a different chapter of the United States Bankruptcy so Code. So even if, even if I pay my, all my creditors back 100%, uh, I'm still going to get pinged because I filed this bankruptcy to get the help I needed? Your credit report will be affected. However, you can explain to future lenders and future mortgage companies that, yes, you filed the Chapter 13, but you paid it back 100%, and you haven't incurred any negative credit since the time that you filed, and that you're a good risk for future credit. And I would bet you are. Well, that sounds good, Dave. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing. Final question, Jess. Final question. Well, final jeopardy. Final jeopardy. What should I do when I'm in this financial despair? What's the very first thing I need to do? Well, the first thing you should do is contact an experienced bankruptcy attorney, someone who has made bankruptcy their life's work, someone who will sit down with you and not charge you for the free consultation and get a fresh start. That's what you really want to do. And if Chapter 13 is the best option, then Chapter 13 is the way to go. But contact an attorney to talk about your case. And that's the best thing I can do for myself. That's the best thing that you can do for yourself. And do some research. Explore online. Jesse, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, this has been Legal Action. We talked about bankruptcy. I'm Dave Siegel. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.